straight into it. Um, we'll actually start on home ground here in St. Andrews and we'll start with uh, Tobias Matson, And he'll be disc uh, discussing decrypting magnetic fabrics, AMS, AARM, AIRM, through the analysis of mineral shaped fabrics and distribution and isotropy. So when you're ready, Tobias. So yeah, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so I'm Tobias and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of St. Andrews, but I'm also affiliated to Stockholm University in Sweden. So I'm a visiting scholar at St. Andrews for two years. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the source of uh, AMS fabrics in rocks and in particular igneous rocks. And in igneous rocks, the, usually the main magnetic carrier is titanium magnetite or magnetite. And then uh, you have essentially two uh, types of fabrics, petrofabrics that might contribute to the AMS fabric. And that's the shape anisotropy, which is basically that the AMS ellipsoid is controlled by the, the axis of the magnetite. And for example, if you have multi-domain magnetite, uh, the long axis of the magnetite crystal will correspond to the K1, the longest axis of the AMS, AMS ellipsoid. Or you can have a distribution anisotropy controlling the AMS. And this is uh, due to the magnetic interaction between, for example, magnetite and ferromagnetic, ferrimagnetic phases. And I have an example here. So for example, we have a distribution, which is like this in the magnetite. And this would correspond to a K1 axis in the AMS, AMS ellipsoid or in this orientation. Um, however, studies on uh, natural rocks, uh, natural igneous rocks have uh, seen very minor or uh, no relation between distribution and isotropy and AMS. Um, and they have argued uh, over the last 20 years that distribution and isotropy is not a significant process uh, uh, generating the AMS fabrics in igneous rocks. Um, However, these studies have been on rocks which have, uh, have uh, where the magnetized crystals are occurring as free floating crystals and they are quite far separated from each other. So they haven't studied rocks where magnetized crystals are closely clustered to each other. And therefore you can argue that they haven't really looked at the right sample to see if distribution and isotropy can be a significant factor controlling the AMS of a rock. So the, the question really that I want to answer with this study is, can distribution and entropy significantly affect the AMS of a rock? And to study this, I've chosen samples, uh, which is a tracheandesite, and it's a porphyric tracheandesite, so it contains larger crystals, which we call phenocryst, or plagioclase, uh, amphibole, and also uh, one volume percent of this rock is magnetite phenocryst. And 50% of the magnetite phenocryst in this rock occur in clusters. So there, there are potential here in this rock to see if uh, distribution and anisotropy can be significant in the AMS of this rock. So um, we choose because um, uh, analyzing distribution and anisotropy and shape fabrics can be quite time consuming because you need to scan them with uh, uh, CT or X-ray tomography. And the separation method takes quite long. So we only choose five samples from five samples, five subspecimens from five samples. So it's not a huge uh, data, uh, sample set, but there's a huge amount of data that we get out of this. Uh, and the, these samples were analyzed for AMS, a, AIRM, so an isotopic isothermal remnant magnetization and an isotopic anesthetic remnant magnetization. And I used a 15 position orientation scheme with an uh, alternating field of 100 millitesla and a DC field of 50 microtesla. And for the IRM, I used also a 15 position orientation scheme, so the hex positions, uh, with a single DC pulse of 20 millitesla. Uh, and I also scanned these samples 
and due to the contrast between the dis these uh, phases in the rock, I could pick out uh, the magnetite and amphibole shape and distribution fabrics using the X-ray CT scan. And here you have an image of the X-ray CT. Uh, and I get, when I scan these rocks or the samples, I got a um, 16 micrometer resolution, meaning that I can see the smallest uh, magnetite phases in these rocks. I, I probably can see a uh, single main magnetite. Uh, we used, I separated uh, the crystals from the scans using the software Blob 3D. And I set, set a lower limit of 500 voxels, which basically means it's the volume of the pixel times 500 uh, as the minimum uh, limit for magnetite, basically to uh, limit processing time and remove also some, uh, some noise. And for amphibole, I set a minimum limit for them at 1,000 voxels. Okay, so uh, to analyze uh, the data that I got, got out from the, the X-ray tomography, so the X-ray scans, uh, I used a software called uh, Tomofab, which was developed by my quarters. Um, and with this software, you can uh, calculate uh, length-weighted crystal axis eigenvectors, which basically generates an uh, ellipsoid with the uh, opposing axis that you can directly compare with the AMS and uh, remnants fabrics. And then uh, for this paper or this study, uh, I've been with them and developing an, another feature of Tomofab, uh, where we basically insert uh, that you can analyze distribution fabric in the software. Uh, and then we use the definition by Stevenson 1994 uh, which basically decides uh, the strength of the interaction. So uh, this is the weighting factor for the distribution endoscopy. So we have the omegas, which is the volume of the two grains. And then we have the distance between the two grains. Uh, and this basically says that crystals that are larger volume and closer to each other uh, gives a higher weight to the distribution anisotropy. And this is also then presented as an ellipsoid with three opposing axes, which you can directly compare with the uh, AMS fabric. So first we look at the shape of the magnetite crystals. So here I have a backscattered electron image of magnetite. Uh, and you can see that this is uh, how they commonly look in the rock. So we have uh, magnetite crystals occurring in clusters. If we separate them, they have these nice cubic shapes and yeah, cubic equin shapes, uh, but with some degree of shape and isotropy anyway. So I mean, this, this, there's a difference between the longest and shortest axis. Um, most of the crystals that we separated are in the size range of 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 uh, mil, uh, millimeter long axis. So this is the, and yeah, most of the volume of the crystals that we separated occur in this size range. Amphibole um, is prolate, cigar shaped. Uh, so you can see an image of a separated uh, amphibole. Uh, here's a backscattered electron image of the amphibole. And uh, you can see at, at the rims of the amphibole, you have these kind of uh, white speckles. And that's actually a breakdown rim in the amphibole, which contain uh, magnetite. You can also see there are some inclusions of magnetite in the amphibole. So this probably affect the magnetic fabric of the amphiboles. Yes, um, here's the AMS data from the whole sample set. Uh, so the small black arrows point out the samples that we were later analyzed with the uh, micro CT. But what I essentially want to show you is that uh, the data set or the samples are uh, represented for the whole or the subspecimen that shoes are represented for the whole sample. So they're not outliers to represent the fabric of the whole, uh, of the whole rock. I also have temperature sensitivity experiments uh, showing that the curves are not reproducible between heating and cooling. Uh, uh, but we also see a distinct drop at around 570, 580 
uh, degree centri centigrade, indicating that magnetite is the, or titanium magnetite is the main magnetic carrier. But we also have uh, probably maghemite, which, which basically results in that the curve is not reproducible between heating, heating and cooling. So now I will go through the data from each, each of these samples. So I will start with the shape fabric here, which I have plotted in lower hemisphere uh, equal area Schmidt nets. So first start with magnetite. So this is the long axis. And you can see the long axis plotted on an east-west girdle distribution, uh, which is then uh, corresponding to that we have the maximum axis of the magnetite here and the intermediate axis here and the minimum here. And for all plots in a cluster, uh, on the on the eastern on the eastern side of the stereo net, and we have a maximum of uh, shape fabric of amphibole here, and intermediate here. If you compare this with the uh, magnetic fabrics, so AMS, AIRM, and AARM, we can see that uh, the maximum is located in the eastern uh, hemisphere. Uh, and the intermediate in this uh, is sort of sub, like sub horizontal in the south. Um, and this basically shows that the AMS here is uh, not really controlled by the shape, completely controlled by the shape of magnetite, but rather the, the shape of the amphibole crystals, but also the magnetic distribution and isotropy of magnetite. Because you can see here we have the uh, dark gray symbols with a uh, dashed outline, which essentially shows the distribution and isotropy of uh, this sample. And it is basically coaxial with the magnetic fabrics in CB15. CB19, uh, which is another sample we have. Uh, here's a little bit more complex. We have a east-west uh, girdle distribution in the magnetite long axis, so the shape fabric. We have a more of a cluster in the southern hemisphere uh, for the amphibole shape fabric. Uh, while the magnetic fabrics plots in the northern hemisphere. So they seem to be inverse to the shape fabrics, but also the distribution fabric in magnetite, which is shown by these symbols with dashed outlines here. So here the magnetic fabrics are inverse relative to the shape and distribution fabrics. In CB46, we have a eastern, a western girdle distribution in magnetite, uh, shallow moderately dipping. We have a moderately, moderately dipping girdle distribution for amphibole here, uh, while the magnetic fabrics are steeply dipping north south girdle distribution. Uh, and if we look at the different petrofabrics, so the shape, fabric of magnetite and amphibole but also the uh, distribution fabric of magnetite. You can see that uh, clearly the distribution fabric is the most steeply dipping. So here the magnetic fabric seems to correlate mostly to the distribution fabric of uh, the magnetite. In CB55, we have a strong girdle distribution, uh, northwest, southeast girdle distribution in magnetite and in amphibole. Uh, we can also see this strong distribution in the magnet magnetic fabrics, but also in all three petrofabrics, so the amphibole and magnetite shape and the magnetite distribution fabric. In CB61, um, we have a strong uh, uh, northwest, southeast girl distribution in the magnetite shape, while the Amphibole shape and magnetite distribution have a east-west moderately southward dipping girdle distribution. And essentially the magnetic fabrics are oriented intermediate in between the magnetite shape and the amphibole shape and magnetite distribution fabric. So it seems that we have a magnetic fabrics being a mix of the two. So if we compare these two, three or four and put them into and show the fabric parameters. So the T fabric shape parameter, which shows the shape. 
So one is an oblate fabric, so a pancake type fabric, and minus one is a prolate, so a cigar shape fabric. And we can see here that uh, the MS fabric is prolate, while the magnetic petrofabric, fabric, so the distribution fabric and shape fabric are uh, oblate, and the amphibole shape fabric is prolate. Uh, so there's, uh, there's something causing the, the, the AMS fabric to become uh, prolate. And if this might be that we have an intersection between uh, delineation fabrics or, or the, the magnetite distribution and the magnetite shape at this point, causing it to become a prolate fabric. Uh, yeah, the similar, the similar in CB46, we have a strong oblate fabric in the magnetite shape and magnetite distribution, while the magnetic fabric has a little bit of a weaker uh, oblate fabric, which might be due to the amphibole, or it's maybe due to an intersection, basically causing a uh, may be that these fabrics are interfering with each other, basically lowering the degree of anisotropy and the shape of the fabric. Um, in CB55, where everything seems to coincide being coaxial, then we have quite a good correspondence between, uh, between the mass fabric and the shape fabric here of magnetite, while we have a little bit lower as distribution fabric, which we can't really explain. And then in CB61, uh, we have a quite strong uh, oblate fabric for all the magnetic fabrics, while the three petro fabrics have a little bit uh, less strong uh, oblate shape. And this it might be due to this kind of mixed fabric interacting with each other and making the magnetic fabric a little bit stronger. If you look at CB19, we should have the inverse fabrics. Uh, uh, relative to the, to the magnetite shape and amphibole shape and the magnetite distribution and isotropy. Uh, uh, it might be that these petrofabrics uh, are basically uh, interfering with each other, which lowers the anisotropy of uh, the rock or the, the sample and make some, uh, for example, uh, single domain magnetite more dominant and, and controlling the AMS fabric. So to look at the single domain contribution or high cursivity uh, phases uh, contribution to the AMS fabrics, I did um, a partial ARM using a, a different AF field, uh, alternating field range. And we can see then that uh, uh, K2 or the R1 or the K, K1 and K2 of the, the ARM are oriented in this uh, north, west, southeast uh, uh, girdle, essentially showing that the, the high coercivity grains uh, have a pr preferably orientation in the, in the north, uh, in northwestern hemisphere or the northeastern and northwestern hemisphere. And this might contribute to to, to the inversion of the fabric. I'm there, Tobias. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So just to summarize, uh, we have the three components of the petrofabric uh, that contribute to the petrofabric. And they either interfere constructively, making the fabric stronger, so we have a stronger uh, uh, degree of anisotropy, or destructively and making the fabric weaker. And this generates the uh, AMS fabric. But what's also interesting is it's that the distribution of anis anisotropy also seems to affect the uh, anis anisotropy of gramic magnetization. So uh, essentially, the, the spatial distribution of magnetite also seems to have some effect on the spatial distribution or on the, uh, the gramic magnetization, which I think so far has not really been shown. Yeah, so thank you. For me. Cool. So, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. sure. Go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Can I, can I ask about how you calculate the distribution anisotropy from your tomography data? I saw at one point you showed an yeah. equation yeah. that sort of that quantified the, the, the DA, and yeah. it seems to be a function primarily of just the distance between particles. But do you not also take into account, or in a in a spherical cluster or whatever? I mean, how 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 do you actually do that? Yeah, so I, I only heard like half of your question because you, you cut out. Okay, but, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's about how you calculate the the, yeah. the distribution anisotropy from the yeah. from the yeah. tomography because uh, it seemed that, that, that the equation you showed was just a function of distance, but but surely the the, the spatial arrangement also comes into it in some way yeah so uh, this this equation is the is the, the the main one that people have used just to calculate distribution and entropy so it's basically you choose the uh, the center point the center point between crystal you take all the crystals that you have in your data set but then you weigh them depending on the the distance between them and the volume of the, the each crystal there have been a new uh, a new equation just published, I think, uh, a couple of weeks ago by Andrea Biederman, and we haven't really looked into this. But this is the this is the main definition that people have used. But I, I agree that there might be some some other kind of uh, spatial thing that you, we need to consider as well. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yeah, well, also just echo what Rich said. It was a really nice talk. Um, I was uh, curious why did micro C CT because the resolution is quite coarse, is sixteen micro uh, yeah. sorry, sixteen microns. Um, yeah. I was just wondering if you thought about trying EBSD. Obviously, that's not three dimensional; it's only two dimensional. But then you can you can map out automatically quite large areas at a much higher resolution. I was wondering if you. Yeah. So uh, when we started this study, we basically wanted to have the same uh, subspecimen uh, that we did the AMS on and run it completely to the, the CT scanner. So we basically have a, we get the 3D resolution exactly from the same core as we did the AMS. And uh, yeah, so we wanted to start with this, but I definitely want to look further in the future, maybe cutting up these cores and, 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 and getting more into detail with the single domain and smaller crystal as well. I, I, I had another question, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, many years ago, Wynne Williams and I published a paper on distribution anisotropy, and we did a micromagnetic approach. And to, yeah. to get it to work, we couldn't model alternating fields, so we did anisotropy of SIRM. Yeah in the distribution of uh, looking at interacting particles. And Mike Jackson said that um, anisotropy of uh, high field signals, you can't really resolve properly, something to do with calculating the eigenvectors. And I never really understood what he meant and I could never find a reference to what he said. Maybe I should have just asked him. I mean, I was just wondering, I mean, so you doing this anisotropy of IRM, I mean, some of the results are really sometimes really quite different to the anisotropy of ARM or, or the AMS. I mean, yeah. do, do you have any th thoughts on the on the dangers of using anisotropy of IRM? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, not 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 really, because uh, the reason that I did this was because our uh, anesthetic magnetizer broke. <laughs> 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 so I just, <laughs> I just tried try this and. But it seems like because I could I could get this uh, very low cursivity range with this, right. and I would presumably be get a high cursivity range with the the AARM. Uh, so it seems like if I, it seems like the the fabric is basically controlled by these very low the low cursivity crystal or crystal grains, and this is basically what I think I got out from the AARM. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a better explanation or answer. Uh, okay, right. So, uh